Chapter 10. They're going to walk all the way to Trenton, nine miles. I'll never be able to walk nine miles in the storm. I'm freezing. Matt curled his half-frozen fingers around the musket. He had taken the cartridge box and put the strap over his head, wearing it under his arm, as he had seen the other soldiers do. Without his down vest, the wind seemed to cut right through him. His notes had begun to run and wouldn't stop. His toes ached with the cold inside of his sneakers. He thought about the turning around and trying to run, but he was afraid that he would be taken for a spy or worse yet, a coward. Where's Adam Hibbs, he wondered, and what will Katie think when she wakes up without me? I wonder if I'll ever see her on or the guys again. I've got to get back to them, but how? His thoughts were suddenly interrupted by Captain McCauley, who, after giving the cape to one of the general's aides, had stopped at a fence row. A group of soldiers were pulling down the rails and had begun to to build small fires to keep from freezing, when the captain ordered them to stop. There will be no fires, he commanded. The men took the boards and used them to sit on instead. Many soldiers slept as they sat upright, while some took to whispering their voices, their voices lost in howling wind. Matt laid his musket on the ground and began pulling on a board, but it wouldn't budge. He felt embarrassed by his weak attempts to pry the board loose. Finally, a young rebel in rags leaned over and helped him to pull it free. Both he and Matt fell backwards as the board came loose in their hands. They quickly got up and carried the board to a clearing. The silence, they, in silence, they sat down beside one another, hugging their knees to their chest to keep warm. The young soldier couldn't have been more than 14 or 15 years old, yet there were dark circles under his eyes, giving him a haggard look of exhaustion. His face was blotchy with a rash that seemed to spread up from his neck. He was just about to close his eyes when he noticed Matt's footwear. With a quizzical look, he inched closer and touched Matt's sneaker. Matt watched as the long fingernails caked with dirt lightly traced the red letters on his ankle. Rebox, Matt whispered. Red coats? The young rebel quickly removed his hand. No. Not red coats. These are Reeboks. You know, sneakers. Sneakers? The rebel looked weary. Oh, I guess you don't know. They're special shoes made of rubber, Matt whispered. But the soldier didn't seem to understand. He surveyed Matt's sweatshirt and jeans. Where are you from, he asked. This dress is foreign to me and not of any colony I know. Matt remembered from his history report that in 1776, each colony still had a separate style of dress. And you could often tell a New York regiment from a regiment of Virginia rebels simply by the color of shirts they wore. He also knew that Nebraska was not yet a colony in 1776. He paused, thinking about his Aunt Shelley and Uncle Mark. Well, I have relatives living in Maryland, he said truthfully. The young rebel nodded, seeming to accept this. My name is Israel Gates, and truth be known, I've never been to Maryland, and I've never seen such queer dress. But... Queer thought, though it be, I would offer a trade for one of those sne sneakers. Sneakers, Matt corrected. A, whatever you be calling them. I would give my shirt for one. It's bright warm, he whispered, offering a raggedy sleeve for Matt to feel. But why trade your shirt for one shoe? Matt didn't understand until Israel unwrapped the rags that bound his left foot. By the light of the moon, Matt could see the long gash that ran along the side of Israel's foot. It was puffy with infection and crusted with dirt. The whole foot seemed to be turning bluish green. The pain of the wound has stopped. It's all numb, and though I'm glad for that, I'm afraid it's freezing up on me, Israel told him. Matt bit down on his lower lip at the sight of the foot and quickly untied his sneaker. Israel began to lift his coat over his head. Matt could see that it was nothing more than an old blanket with a slit at the top and some crude stitching along the sh sides. No, keep your shirt, Matt whispered. I'm warm enough. He took up a sneaker and sock and offered them to Israel. What kind of stockings are these? Israel asked, feeling the soft cotton while peering down at the green stripes that went along around the top of the sock. Matt couldn't help a smile. Nerd socks. That's why my friend Tony call. That's what my friend Tony calls them. He won't wear any socks that have stripes. Israel gave Matt a strange look on hearing this, and Matt suddenly realized the luxurious life he had left behind, where you could refuse to wear a sock just because it has stripes. 
Israel put his foot in the sneaker with some difficulty, though he did get it in. Matt breathed a sigh of relief. Thanks, Dad, he muttered under his breath, for his mother had always said that he got his big feet from his father's side of the family. Matt suddenly thought of his father and mother, and tears came to his eyes as he wondered if he would ever see them again. What did you say? Israel asked. Oh, I was just thinking how glad I was for once that I have such big feet for a kid. Matt said, wiping a tear from his cheek. A goat? Israel frowned. No, where I came from, we call boys kids. Like, I would be a regular kid and you're older, so you would be a big kid. Matt tried to explain. Israel cocked his head and smiled slowly. Where I come from, they'd be calling you a, a sight dim for the telling a man with a musket that he's an old goat. Matt was about to explain further when he saw that Israel was laughing. I guess it does sound funny. Matt gla laughed as he quickly undid his other sneaker. He took off his one sock and put it on his left foot and then replaced the sneaker on his right foot. Matt knew that he would have to keep both feet covered to keep them from freezing. He knew it wouldn't be long before his sock became wet from stepping on ice and snow, and he wondered if he would have to, the courage that Israel had to keep going. Israel saw the worried look on his face and some silently leaned over and began to wrap Matt's left foot in the dirty linen stripes, strips that had once been around his own foot. When he was through, both boys stretched out their legs and grinned. I don't know your name, Israel whispered, reaching into his ha ha haversack. Matt, uh, Matthew Carlton, Matt said shyly. Well, Matthew Carlton, you've been a good friend to me and I'll never forget it. Here, have some of this, he said, offering Matt what looked like a burnt piece of meat. Matt was starving and gratefully accepted the gift. Um, it's good. What is it? He asked with a mouthful. Pigeon, Israel replied. I trapped one a few days before we crossed the river. I'm glad I had enough time to roast him. Pigeon? I'm eating pigeon? Matt thought with a grimace. Israel reached down and looked up a handful of snow in his mouth. Would, would that we had a small beer to wash it down with. Now there would be a feast. Um, a real feast, Matt said limply. With that, we had a Coke and a hamburger with a side of fries. Now that would be a feast, Matt thought to himself as he brought some snow to his mouth. I, it won't be long before I'll be eating regular meals again, and if we live through the next six days, I shall return your gift in kind, Israel told him, trying to warm his hands with his breath. My enlistment comes due the first of the year, and with my wages I can pay for the nerd stocking and chew. Don't worry about it, Matt whispered, but what will you do when your enlistment enlistment is up? Will you sign up again and stay the fight? Israel closed his eyes and shook his head wearily. This regiment is the 12th of Massachusetts, and I don't know that many of us could re-enlist even if we wanted to. We barely got out of Montreal alive, and with the Indians and then the pox. The march in Albany killed off most of our wounded and sick, and this last march to Pennsylvania took still more. Those of us left had barely enough strength to lift our muskets. And tell me, what good will these be? He said, reaching for his gun. They're soaked after all this rain and snow, and it will surely be a miracle to get them firing. At least you have a bayonet, he pointed to Matt's musket. Oh, I know there are those that are in high spirits because we seem to be on the offense at least. But I'll wager you won't find much cheer here. I've seen so much hardship that you could make me a general and I wouldn't re-enlist. No, he sighed. I've had enough of army life. All I want now is to get back to Massachusetts in a warm bed and a slice of hunter's pie. And besides, I've got to deliver these. He pulled out a small leather pouch from his pack and a dozen glass beads fell into his outstretched palm. Aren't they fine? He whispered as the light of the moon bounced off the delicate painted glass. They'll make one pretty necklace. He smiled. They are pretty, Matt agreed. What do you have to deliver them to? To one very demanding lady. Israel's blue eyes seemed to twinkle as he said that. He said this. Oh, Matt mumbled like a girlfriend. Girlfriend? Well, yes, she is a girl and surely a friend and also the fairest maid in Massachusetts. She's got a mop of girl, gold curls and the face of an angel. 
Though truth be telling, she's got a devil of a temper. When she's vexed with you, she'll stamp her feet and shake her little fists. She's something to contend with, I'll guarantee. Matt moved closer to Israel. She, he wasn't much interested in hearing about girlfriends, but he was glad for the company, no matter what they talked about. Maybe, he thought to himself, with Israel for a friend, I'll be able to get through this march. A chilling wind swept through across the clearing, and Matt hugged his knees even closer to his chest. What's your girlfriend's name? Matt asked with a shiver. Israel smiled. Abby, but I'll call her my Gabby Abby, she, he laughed. Not five years old, and she can out-talk a tinker on a Monday. Five years old? Matt looked perplexed. Hey, she's my little sister. Israel smiled, wiping his nose on his sleeve. My mom, my mother died in birthing her, and since I was the eldest, I promised my mom that I would watch over the little ones. My father was a likeness for rum, you see. He spends most of his days, most of his day in the tavern. Well, then who's looking after Abby now? Matt asked. My brothers, Israel told him. Ben is 12 years, Simon is 11, and Nathan is 8. They're good boys, but surely I hated to leave them alone. Israel's voice trailed off as he gazed up into the moon. It must have been hard for you to choose, Matt whispered. Choose? Israel's eyes, eyebrows shot up. You know, though, choose between your family and your country is what a soldier has to do, I guess. Make his country safe for his family, right? Israel shook his head and gave a low, sarcastic laugh. His voice became a husky whisper. I don't know about you, but I thought these colonies were safe enough without a war. I had no desire to be a soldier, and I wouldn't be here now if my father hadn't drank up what little coin he managed to bring in from his tailoring. I had to keep my promise to my mother, so it was up to me to see that we didn't starve. I sold the only thing I could, and, and come December 31st, my debt is paid. I don't understand, Matt whispered. Israel studied his young friend's face. You remind me of my brother Simon, bright eyes and thick head. He sighed. I sold myself as a substitute for a wealthy silver, silversmith in, in Boston. I took on his enlistment papers in return for a cow and enough coin to keep my sister and brothers fed till spring. I only planned to stay until the enlistment was up, but when I found myself marching on foot on, in Montreal with a party of Indians fast on our heels, I decided to re-enlist so I could get home under the Army's protection. And besides... They were paying $6 a month. Now I have just six more days to go, and I can head home. He closed his eyes and smiled. Then he opened his hand and looked down at the beads again. I promised Abby a present, and so when we came across a tinker on the road to Albany, I asked to see his wares. As soon as I saw these, I knew Abby would love them. Blue was her favorite color, he said, turning his beads over in his hand. They come from France, you know, the tinker told me so, he grinned. My lieutenant was right vexed with me for spending my last pistories on pretties. He scolded me for not buying some leather that I could have made up with some decent shoes, but I promised Abby I'd bring her back the prettiest present I could find, and it was my last bit of coin. Many a tinker and shopkeeper wouldn't, won't take the paper were paid. They don't believe the continental currency is worth anything. But then you must know that, though in truth, you don't look old enough to count your wages, much less earn them. How did you come to enlist? Um, Matt squirmed, trying not to look at Israel. The truth is, I didn't enlist. And you're right, I'm not old enough. It was an accident. You see, I got separated from my friends and sister. I have a little sister, too. Her name is Katie. Anyway, I was sleeping at a friend's house, and I thought we could have an adventure. So we went for this walk after my friend, my friend's parents went to sleep. And then his voice was beginning to crack as he tried to hold back the tears. I don't know how this happened, how he ended up here. I never knew it would be like this. I'm not from here, Israel. You have to believe me. I'm from another. It's all right, Israel interrupted him, leaning over and putting his arm around him. I'll look after you. We two goats. We'll get through this together. You'll see. And when we, my enlistment is up, we'll find your Katie and you and she can come and visit me and Abby and the boys. Don't worry, Matthew Carlton. You've got a friend in Israel Gates. You can depend on it.